Morning, everyone. Um, can I say, Jerome, you have set the scene really well for what I hope will be an exciting conference. Now, normally in the financial system, excitement is, is not really welcome, uh, but we have work to do around particularly capital markets unions. So I'm hoping for lots of strong engagement. Um, and I hope that my speech will stimulate some of that debate. I'm really happy to be here in Frankfurt. Um, uh, I thought I was getting a warm welcome because we saw lots of excitement in Frankfurt yesterday evening, nothing to do with the financial system, uh, but very happy people going to football matches. Not all of them happy with the result, but that's life. There are winners and there are losers. Can I firstly thank the ECB and indeed my own services in the Commission for organising this really important conference and a special word of appreciation to ECB Vice President de Guindos um, for what is a really important event. We're talking about fundamental issues in the financial system, but also how we advance our agenda on sustainability and digitalization. And as is no surprise to everyone in this room, money will matter in advancing the cause of both. So I want to get down to business straight away and talk about uh, capital markets union and banking union. Both are essential and they complement one another. Uh, but not just talk about the why we need it, but how we're going to make progress in what appears sometimes to be a very difficult landscape. So on the question of why, it's already addressed. We need money, we need investments. Um, and the estimates vary, but the Commission uses a figure of an additional investment of more than 600 billion euros every single year for the climate transition. Uh, and this is about investing in all of the renewables, the technologies, uh, insulation, you know, right down to the very basics that our citizens fully understand and know. But also investing in new clean and green technologies, uh, which, you know, will show uh, the fruits um, when we get the investment in and the products uh, and the innovations out. But if I look beyond uh, the climate transition, we also need private investment in digital technologies in innovation and, of course, defence. Public finance uh, will not be enough to meet these massive investment needs. And banks, of course, will play a role, but they don't have the capacity to fill the gap by themselves. Instead, the funding will need uh, mainly to come from capital markets. So we need the Capital Markets Union, better known as CMU in the industry. So I may use CMU uh, in the rest of my contribution. And this is a really big project for the European Union. When I was a member of the European Parliament, of course, it was discussed, not advanced hugely, but we make some incremental progress. Um, it's a project that has direct benefit for citizens because it answers the question that they ask, how are we going to fund the climate and digital transformation? It also addresses the political question of how do we have a transition uh, that leaves no one behind. And therefore, the link between people and this project is key. The truth, though, is that we've just come out of a European election campaign in 27 member states where I didn't hear the words CMU and I didn't hear Capital Markets Union much discussed. And it's extraordinary. I fought four European Parliament elections since 2004, I was never asked about what, how is progress on banking union and capital markets union. However, I have been asked frequently why as a citizen I can't borrow in another member state. So I think we need to um, use the opportunity to speak to citizens because they will drive change more than it being led just from the top. So in a way, the campaign for the European Parliament was a missed opportunity. Uh, and I hope and I will be imploring the incoming parliament to get fully behind our efforts to make progress on capital markets union. Because citizens do know that there are barriers when it comes to uh, accessing uh, financial products in the single market. Um, and therefore we need to address this concern. Because fragmentation uh, leads to inefficiency, missed opportunity, and it is a barrier to maximizing the benefits of a single market for capital, which frankly is one of the four freedoms that has yet to be fully um, in place in the European Union. So here we have a lot of work to do, but there's also opportunities when we get the work done. 
If I look to banking union, it helps to make sure that account holders uh, know money is protected the same way uh, across member states. Uh, and banking union is not only there to protect taxpayers and depositors' money, but also to create a single market for banks to the benefit again of businesses, citizens, and the banks themselves. Because a true banking union will lead to more competition, more affordable financing for companies and households, uh, and better financial services. And meanwhile, capital markets union would provide an opportunity to put savings to good use, no matter where you are in the European Union. And this provides better returns over the long term, helping our citizens prepare for many things, including for retirement. And the amount of savings, because Europeans are great savers, uh, it's quite extraordinary the amount of money that rests peacefully, but not actively, in savings, in deposits. We're talking about 33 trillion euros, not an insignificant sum, but perhaps hard to conceptualize because it is so significant. And I think if we can effectively mobilize these savings on our capital markets, we can unlock a significant source of investment capital. Uh, and this is key. I want to emphasize, uh, of course, that we're not starting from scratch. There are colleagues in this room from the Commission who've been working on Capital Markets Union uh, long before I've been engaged in it, and you'll hear from them later. Um, you can see from the Commission's European Financial Stability and Integration Review what's being done, because that will be presented this morning, highlighting that the EU is largely self-reliant in terms of many key financial services. So we do have a very solid base on which to build. And this is good news for our open strategic autonomy agenda. But there is a but here, because our capital markets are still not developed enough uh, to meet our vast financing needs. And what we need in the European Union is a deep, liquid and unified capital market. We need a single market for capital rather than a collection of small and fragmented capital markets. And I mean, there is a third point. The banking union and the capital markets union are projects that reinforce each other. CMU requires strong banks that can operate across the single market, especially for services like listing and trading. A genuine CMU would also enable banks to scale up their activities and services. And, and finally, maybe on the why, there is a huge cost if we do not act. And I here look at figures from uh, New Financial, a think tank. Their estimation is that um, another 4,400 companies in the EU could raise an extra 470 billion euros every year on capital markets if we get there. And that's an additional 12 trillion euros in long-term capital, which could be put to work in the EU economy to help boost sustainable growth. And that's money and investment that we are missing at the moment. So sometimes I'm asked to do, um, you know, impact assessments on various proposals. And I think more and more we should do impact assessments on if we don't act rather than just on when we do make proposals. And I think those figures spell out the impact of positive engagement uh, with CMU. And I also think it links very well with our strong discussions at the moment around competitiveness of the European Union. So let me move to what we need to do. I've said we've made good progress on this project during this Commission mandate. So the European Single Access Point, this online portal for company financial and sustainability information is being set up. We've agreed the Listing Act, again here to reduce red tape, making it easier for companies to get listed and stay listed. We're working on setting up the EU consolidated tape for a single view of EU trading data. EU finance ministers unanimously adopted the FASTER directive uh, last month, providing for simpler and quicker processes for withholding tax. So political momentum is certainly with uh, Capital Markets Union. EU leaders in the European Council and finance ministers in the Eurogroup have given their strong backing. We have many contributions to this project, the letter report, the Neue report, the anticipated report from Mario Draghi. So all of this is really encouraging. Now, now we just need to translate that support for CMU 
into support for specific measures that will build it. So it's time for action more than words. And I would say we have picked all the low hanging fruits. So we now have to reach higher in terms of ambition to tackle those more significant barriers that exist. And we need the full support of EU leaders and ministers to tackle those barriers. And you know, this is a moment where we will need to set aside national vested interests, public or private, in favor of the long-term European goals that will benefit all of us. One of the barriers that's often mentioned are differences in solvency law among member states. And this is a fact today. There are many different insolvency pieces of legislation. So investors in the single market have 27 different sets of insolvency laws to contend with. And we do have a proposal on the table to tackle this, to make those 27 different laws more consistent and efficient. But again, I have to say with significant regret that progress in the negotiations among the member states is slow, despite the urgency of CMU and despite political commitments to the project. Another example, our retail investment strategy proposal was very specific in its objectives to make it easier for small scale everyday investors to participate on capital markets. But again, progress is slow. And our ambition in the Commission, my ambition, was significantly watered down by both the Parliament and Member States. And this means um, that we don't tackle as many of the barriers to retail investment as we know exist and hinder retail investors. So now we're looking ahead to the next mandate with the new European Parliament just elected to be followed soon by the new European Commission. There are clear indications of what issues the new Commission will need to tackle. Uh, and let me say very clearly that nibbling at the edge of this problem will not give us the results that we need. So we do need to uh, hear and see that the words are matched by strong action amongst Member States and the Parliament. Because if we don't do that, we do risk not getting the full benefits of capital markets union. So a number of topics are on our agenda. So I'll start with securitization. The Commission is looking and analysing at how to revive the EU securitization market to make it more attractive for issuers and investors. And I can confirm that we will launch a public consultation in the autumn so we can act as soon as possible to scale up the EU securitization market. And the advantages of securitization are clear. It frees up bank balance sheets, uh, allowing for additional investments, which could reach substantial amounts. It also provides an additional asset for banks to invest in. Next to pan-EU savings products. We should explore this to ensure that EU citizens can save for their future effectively. And I think there are positive lessons we can take from auto enrolment for private or occupational pensions, both inside and outside the European Union. I think there's also lessons, maybe less positive, that we can take from the pan-European uh, personal pension, which has underperformed. The PEP suffered from a low cap on costs and from the diversity of tax treatment across the EU, including a lack of tax incentives. And we will need to consider factors like taxation, product portability, investment horizons, and asset allocation. And now to a third point already alluded to, supervision, um, which is a critical area for discussion and is a difficult political issue. But for me, as I look at this landscape, it's very difficult to see a genuine single market for capital with 27 or indeed more national supervisors. So a company operating in several member states may have to deal with several different regulators, which may each have different interpretations. Fragmented national supervision will do nothing to address our need to boost EU competitiveness and cut red tape. And fragmentation is not an efficient way to do business. Now, I also want to be very clear that, of course, single supervision cannot happen overnight, but it does need to happen over time um, and perhaps not too uh, lengthy a period. But I should also say that we should not make it the only focus of capital markets union or allow it to be the only visible impediment uh, to it, which I am concerned about uh, in some of the conversations that I hear. I just would say that later on today, and very happily while in Frankfurt, I'm visiting IOPA. 
And I think that's a reminder not to forget that central supervision is not just about capital markets and ESMA. We should also look to other areas, including the insurance industry. But in any case, we need to have the discussion on supervision now, which is why this afternoon's panel is so important. There are different approaches we could consider, and I'll give you an example. We could start with groups uh, or market infrastructures that provide services across the whole of the single market. ESMA and IOPA should be able to make the supervisory system more effective and efficient. And this could be through an opt-in regime or joint supervision. A word then on market consolidation, because again, this is another priority and a topic that will be discussed in the panel today. ECB President Lagarde made an important point in her speech on CMU late last year. Instead of waiting for fragmented markets to integrate by themselves, Europe should actively anchor the Capital Markets Union around a unifying project. I mean, does it really make sense to have numerous trading venues with very few or even no initial public uh, offerings? Because that's a sign those venues are not really delivering as a source of new financing. And in the same way, does it make sense to have some 20 central security depositories when the US has only won? Again, member states should set aside national symbols and recognize that consolidation is crucial over the long term to develop a single market for capital. The Commission has launched a study on the consolidation of investment funds, trading and post-market infrastructures. We should think single market, embracing capital markets union as a European project that has enormous benefits for all of us. So I've talked about capital uh, market funding, but I want to just emphasize that banks will continue to play a very important role for the EU economy. We do have a strong banking sector in the European Union, robust capital positions and sufficient liquidity. And that is down to the reforms we carried out, including banking union single supervision by the ECB. And this ensures that banks in the 21 participating member states are subject to very high, consistent standards of supervision. And this is underpinned by a single rule book, following a long process of reforms to safeguard against any future crisis. The final element of this process is our banking package, which implements the final elements of the international Basel standards. Completing the Basel III post-financial crisis reforms is a major achievement, and it's important that we stick to the date of implementation we committed to, 1st of January 2025. It is in the EU's interest to implement Basel standards. Banks are competitive only when they are resilient and well supervised. And I think we all know in this room, and indeed in the wider world, the price we all pay when banks go into crisis. At the same time as with any international agreement, it's essential that all parties implement faithfully. And this is important for the credibility of international standard setting bodies. And this is what we did in the European Union. And we are monitoring implementation in the rest of the world. The only area where the European Commission is empowered to delay the entry into application of standards is market risk, if the level playing field cannot be ensured. And this is the so-called fundamental review of the trading um, uh, book, or FRTB. Rules on market risk are very important for investment banks, uh, and there is strong competition between European, internationally active banks, and other global banks. I think by now it's become clear that there will be a delay in the United States in implementing Basel. In practice, the entry of application of the Basel standards in the US is now highly unlikely to take place before January the 1st, 2026 at the earliest. And this is why we have decided to use the Commission empowerment to postpone the date of application of the rules on market risk in the EU by one year until January the 1st, 2026. This one year delay ensures a global level playing field for those big European banks competing with other global players. It gives us time to see what others are doing. We will work closely with the new European Parliament and Council in this process. We will adopt um, uh, this delay by way of a delegated act. And this, of course, is subject to scrutiny by Member States and Parliament. 
And this will take a minimum of three months. So as you know, our procedures do not allow us to take decisions on postponement at the very last moment. We will adopt this delegated act as, as soon as possible, again, working with the newly elected European Parliament. But I think it's really important that we give clarity now to our banks. I would also add that we sincerely hope that the US will apply the Basel III standards at the earliest opportunity. And the delay of one year of the market risk rules in the EU should not be considered an encouragement to depart from this international agreement. In the EU, we are firmly adhering to our date of January the 1st, 2025, for entry into application of the bulk of the Basel standards. But on market risk, we do need to ensure a global level playing field and alignment on the entry into application of the rules. And as you know, given the length of uh, the procedures to postpone these in the EU, we could not wait any longer. Let me look then to the future uh, about banking union. The Eurogroup agreed to strengthen the common framework for bank crisis management and national deposit guarantee schemes. And that this reform should make sure that more small and medium sized banks are included in resolution. Member states should agree their position on this framework today. Now, progress is welcome, but as there are a few buts in my speech today, but I have to say very clearly, I regret that the Council's general approach departs significantly from the Commission proposal. Another essential component is also still missing, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, EDIS. I hope that progress on crisis management can lead to progress also on EDIS. And here I welcome that the Econ Committee of the Parliament managed to vote on its report ahead of the elections. After nine years of stalemate, it is encouraging to see progress. Moving to a topic which is already a major issue, um, and that is around digitalization. So a modern integrated financial system is also increasingly a digital financial system. And we've done a lot of work during this Commission mandate to embrace innovation, but also addressing any risks that can arise from new technologies, including artificial intelligence, uh, which has already been embraced by the financial sector. Bankers, insurers, investment managers already using AI to make forecasts, to automate processes, to reduce costs and increase efficiency. AI systems can analyze data from a wide range of sources market trends, economic indicators, and of course, consumer behavior. And this could help financial institutions make more informed decisions using lots of information. But of course, again, there are risks with AI in finance, uh, like leaving a decision to a non-transparent algorithm on whether someone can get a loan or not. Now we have the European Union's new AI Act together with existing financial sector rules this provides a very solid basis to allow for technological innovation while managing the risks. It is now important that the authorities in charge work closely together and with the market to implement these rules in a coherent and sensible manner. And it's important for the Commission, including the AI Office, to work closely together with the European supervisory authorities and national authorities to inform all of this really important work and understand what the market needs. Today, we are launching a stakeholder consultation. And I know many of you will be interested in this, and I would invite you to consult the website of DG FISMA and participate in this consultation. So briefly, a few closing remarks in relation to this topic um, high on our priority, uh, Capital Markets Union and of course, Banking Union. Um, we have had really important political declarations. And of course, these declarations do set the scene. They are vital, but they're not enough. They have to be matched now by actions. Member states need to set aside the short-term national interest and think European. The costs of inaction here are enormous. Not acting means failing to finance the climate transition, failing to invest in digitalization and innovation, failing those startups and scale-ups and unicorns who need investment, failing to drive economic growth and job creation. Now, I do believe that EU leaders, ministers and MEPs recognize the cost of inaction, but they now need to act collectively. And they need to think single market, think European, instead of thinking about borders, about national concerns. It's not in the script, but I never use the words 
cross border, except when I'm explaining explaining why I don't use the words cross border, because I think even the use of those words really impact the mindset. Let's talk single market. Let's avoid the CB word, because that is what is impeding progress around financial infrastructure and integration. And just to say that the Commission is preparing the way, but Member States and the European Parliament have an opportunity to act now and with urgency, with the files on insolvency and the retail investment strategy. And I hope they'll take that opportunity. I will use the opportunity of my remaining few months in this mandate to speak loudly and clearly on this topic. I have watched and listened to this debate and I am now energized because my time is short to make sure that others also agree and act. Because the European Union speaks of open strategic autonomy, of building resilience, of addressing vulnerabilities, of investing in a more sustainable and digital future. You can't do that without money. We won't do it without capital markets union and banking union. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner uh, McGuinness. Uh, we have time for questions. Thank you again for uh, your speech. I think it was a very comprehensive review on the state of play on capital markets union. Uh, it was also full of uh, stimulating messages on what we should do. And also you designed a very clear roadmap on uh, what the new commission and new legislators should do. So we have time for questions. We start with questions uh, in the room. Uh, one of our colleagues will circulate among the rows and you can ask a question. Otherwise, we have the Mentimeter. I see a question here. Thank you. Uh, Martin Sandberg from the Financial Times. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, the letter report mentioned as an option a 28th regime on insolvency law. That, that's not something you mentioned, and as far as I'm aware, it's not the Commission's approach. Uh, what do you think of it? On that one, I think we can talk to you after this, Martin, if that's okay, uh, on that particular point, um, because it's quite a specific one. So I'd rather take some general questions, but happy to address that after. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you were listening to me because stunned silence in the room. Maybe we'll go back to Martin's question. Sorry. Thank you very much. I am myself a proponent of financial um, integration. However, what do you say to those people that they voice concern because national exchanges and national economies have a, a symbiotic relationship and we're not the um, United States of Europe. So if uh, uh, due to financial integration, uh, big infrastructure or exchanges, cream scheme local national exchanges, what is the impact for national economies? What will be the role of national exchanges in uh, uh, financial integration uh, area? And I'm talking from example from the perspective of a small country like Greece with a, a very uh, local economy. What will happen to Greek companies that want to get listed? What will happen to Greek exchange in an integrated uh, financial market? Okay, I think we need to think differently. I, I think today what's happening is exactly to your point um, of the question that everybody's saying, what, what about Greece? What about, you know, whatever, what member states? But that me merely means embedding the status quo. And the problem is that Greek companies, startups who are, we, we do lots of great startups in Europe, but they go elsewhere. They go to the US to scale up. So I would put it the other way. What would happen if we continue to look in, inwards in each member state? So we have 27 internal thoughts on, on this topic. Um, and, and what will happen is we will go backwards. Um, because in one sense, the last five years, um, we've had enormous crisis to deal with. But the one thing we have learned is that we are, we need to strengthen our resilience. And we do have a big plan around sustainability and digitalization, but we haven't quite told citizens where the money will come from, which also then leads citizens to begin to question the, the direction of, of travel. Um, so that's the first point. I think that the second point is, and I think it's fair to say that, of course, this requires consultation and listening to those member states who are concerned. 
Um, we need to build more trust, I think, within the single market between member states. Um, and we need to rather see the advancement of integration, not as a winner loser, but as a win win. Um, and of course, that's difficult if you're looking inwards to your own infrastructure and wanting to preserve it. But preservation isn't growth. And we have seen across uh, the European Union where there are issues around uh, infrastructure that, that isn't delivering. So I think it's a question of a, a new start. So we have a new European Parliament. They're already busy working through the politics and committees, etc. Uh, we will have a new commission take over towards the, the end, the autumn of, the, of this year. Um, and I think we know what the challenges are. They're big. And I think we also know that in order to address them, we need that big bang of finance and investment. And we need to think investment versus cost. But again, I do think that, you know, around the table of finance ministers, because we've had these conversations, I can hear those member states who have a little bit of anxiety that they will lose and others will gain. And I think we need to allow that conversation to be heard. And also that we in the commission uh, very specifically address that that is not our objective as a commission. We want to lift all boats, but we want we want really to have a single market for capital. We've had a single market for 30 years. It really doesn't exist effectively for capital. And I think it needs to happen and it needs to happen now. And I always think at the start of a mandate, certainly the commission is very determined. I'm going to leave a little note for whoever succeeds me to say very clearly where we are at, where I think the issues are. And I think they're more around that dynamic of some member states anxious. They know it, we need it, but there's an anxiety there. And also maybe uh, those who, who are less anxious should try to allay the fears of their neighbours as to what the overall objective is. Thank you very much. Uh, Rafael Plata from the European Association of Clearing Houses. Uh, thanks a lot for your words, Commissioner. Um, it was interesting, very interesting the way you put it when you said that you have addressed the low-hanging fruits of the Capital Markets Union. I'd say that probably all of us, uh, sorry, in the uh, corridors of Brussels would probably say could agree with that. So now it's really reconforting to say, to think that the EU is really trying to achieve perhaps the not so low-hanging fruit and the most difficult ones probably. One of the difficult ones could be taxation. Um, in taxation, you refer to that, and we see different systems of taxation, different incentives for uh, savers, for pensioners, and we see some very good examples in some parts of the EU. What role do you think the European Commission can actually play in trying to either simplify taxation structures or try to use taxation as an incentive uh, for a better use of capital? Thank you. Well, I mean, we all know that usually member states learn from one another. Uh, and I think in this process, it, the finance ministers are already exchanging um, what they do to the benefit of all. Um, I mean, in my role, I don't deal with taxation, but I very much welcome the agreement on, on the recent proposal. Um, because I think anything that is a barrier uh, to what we're trying to achieve has got to be addressed. But also, anything that can be an incentive to what we're trying to achieve should be looked at. And, and you know, savers react to incentives. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the stickiness of savings, and I suppose that's because we don't have a retail investment culture. Um, I become really aware of this when I, uh, because I was a member of parliament for a long time, and you realize that amongst our citizens, even financial literacy skills are, are, are quite low. We've identified that in, in studies. So there's also a gap there between industry to some extent and the citizen. Uh, and I would also say the industry needs to look at this. They need to look at their own behaviors and practices in order to unlock the potential uh, of that. So what, what is actually happening at the moment is we're listening very carefully we're, we're at what member states are doing with the idea that we exchange best practice. Uh, and I dare say that whoever is responsible on the tax side will, will look at this in conjunction um, with the work that we do, because it, going back to the very core, you remove barriers and you provide the incentives. It's, it's, it's two sides of the one coin, and I think both are really important. 
So maybe one last question from the floor, and then I have one question from the Mentimeter to give a chance to people uh, online to also ask questions. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Willem Sprenkler from the Association of Proprietary Traders. Um, I would like to hear your view on the role of investment firms in the capital markets union, because I think we all acknowledge, if I have acknowledged that, that we are quite dependent on banks and bank financing in the EU. Um, and you've talked about banking package, banking rules, uh, banking competition between the US and, and the EU, but I haven't heard you mentioning uh, investment firms once. So what's your, role of inf your, your view on the role of investment firms in the CMU project? As soon as you have the microphone, what's your thoughts? I, I think uh, investment firms uh, ha find it difficult at the moment to basically uh, compete with, with banks and they can, they, they can, I think they can provide nice competition with, on the level of brokerage, asset management, trading, um, but they struggle to compete with the banks at the moment. And I think the, the entry barriers for investment firms are quite high at the moment. Um, so I think it would be wise to, to strengthen the role of investment firms in the capital markets union. I think we should just take note of that because, I mean, these are, the, these are part of the whole work around a single market for capital. Uh, it's to the very point of the previous question. If there are barriers that make it really difficult, that are not necessary, and that can be um, gotten rid of without causing any problems around financial stability, then we have to look at the entire package. Um, I think what's extraordinary, if I look out from a wider lens, when the conversation, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, on, on Capital Markets Union began, um, you know, I think there was more hope that we would advance it more rapidly. And my own view is that we didn't democratize it. We didn't make it a, an issue that citizens are engaged in and active in. We, we kept it separate from the, to the financial system, the financial world. Um, I think that needs to change. Uh, and I, I believe that it is beginning to change. And it's beginning to change because the financial world and the political world are now in sync here. And so far as we have made big commitments around sustainability and digitalization, which require investment. That can only come from the financial system, but not as it's structured today. And therefore, we have to look at all the barriers, including the ones you have alluded to, both in your question and your comment, um, as well as all of the incentives that may be needed to drive uh, the investment culture. Thank you, Commissioner. So if you don't mind, one question from the Mentimeter, which I find interesting, I read it to you. Why to put so much emphasis on securitizations if covered bonds markets in the EU are much bigger? I think uh, just on the securitization, um, I think because there is a need to reawaken the securitization market because it has benefits, as I mentioned in my speech. I also would note, though, that um, even at my own hearing, there are still some anxieties uh, among some in the political world around securitization. Um, which we need to address, and that's why we're having the, the, the consultation, so that we can look at where is the market today, what is its potential, uh, and how do we actually get there. Um, so I take the point, the second question, uh, the second point of that question, but I don't think it takes from our focus on securitization, because I think this will only, our, our, our in, in, I mean, our objective will only achieve by using all of the elements. Uh, that are available within the EU financial infrastructure and architecture, and then changing and amending them in a way which loosens up uh, capital in the single market. Uh, and this is why I think we need to look at every single possible option. Uh, that's the work that this Commission has been and is continued to engage in, so that there will be progress including uh, on securitization and other topics in the mandate of the next commission and parliament. Uh, and, and as one colleague mentioned in the question, you know, the low hanging fruit wasn't that easy to pick. Um, you know, even though we were standing on a box and putting our arm up, it, it, it wasn't the easiest. Uh, I mentioned my own, you know, regrets around certain approaches. Um, and therefore, the next steps will be a tougher stretch. Uh, but I think they will test the political will of our leaders and our finance ministers. Um, I think we've had very strong reports, the letter report, the Neuer report. We have indications coming from what the Draghi report will say on competitiveness. And therefore, in one sense, if those who've looked for excuses, they will find there's fewer of them to say we can't act or we're afraid to act or it's not in our interest to act. Um, and I think, I think that should galvanize the political 
effort that is required to deliver on these big projects. Um, but I'd remind ourselves, it's 30 years since the single market was established. So maybe in year 31 is a good moment to move really well on these topics. I don't say that out of any kind of disrespect to the past, but as a sign that there's huge opportunities here. You know, we, we actually have a great opportunity to deliver. Um, we have all of the reports, the comments, the endorsements, um, and they weren't easy to deliver either, frankly, um, because I was part of some of the discussions. Now we have to move, and the time now is to act.